have it in this space. And to all of you for creating the trash that we're working with. <laughs> <laughs> um, Nothing. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for taking the time to listen to this message. And we're really excited to share and really honored to have the opportunity to share this message. Yeah. So. Thanks to Building 180 for supporting us as artists and for our uh, visions and dreams. Yeah. Uh, take larger hold in the world. It's incredible, and it's uh, really been the missing link for me. Um, a brief background introduction. Uh, my name is Joel Stockdale. I'm an artist, a sculptor who has been creating large-scale animals specifically for about the past five years, uh, six years, full-time, uh, and this is a life of the trash life, which has uh, <laughs> taken many forms, but uh, in its most uh, purest and the, the most simplest way to explain it, it's nothing more than an homage to the animal relatives that we share this place with. And so the act of taking what uh, we as humans leave behind, our waste products and our consumer world, uh, which are normally um, strewn across the grounds and lands that we're building on. Uh, the act is simply to collect these elements of disuse and turn them into an object of uh, homage, of uh, honor to, uh, to our relatives that we, we oftentimes are forcing out or um, uh, not paying attention to. And so um, it's a real simple thing that has grown and grown and grown. And um, Justina and I have been doing this together for two years. Um, but this has spanned four continents, our work together in these animals, and the, the whole idea is that we come to a place and we build an animal that's native to that area from the trash we can collect. It's a, it's a simple formula that is very complicated. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, yeah, we're really excited to share the project right now. Yeah, and everyone, my name is Yusina, um, and I also a trash artist, and I've been working with Joel for the past two years. Um, uh, we met while I was building large-scale bamboo sculpture um, and through the festival world, but um, my background is in environmental science and sustainable environmental design, and my kind of focus in life and hope is to reanimate this world through space um, to make us really realize the materiality that is around us. It's beautiful and abundant. This earth gives us so much, so much to live for and so much to create from. Um, and I think reanimating the space and reanimating the world we live in through sculpture, and through art, and through changes in the way we hold space um, can impact us and impact our mindset. I think the paradigm shift of sustainability comes way beyond and from our heart, and I think art has a really big voice in that. So that's why I'm here. Yeah. <laughs> uh, we want to tell you a little bit literally about our project um, because we're only allowed to tell you a little bit the, we are really really pleased and grateful to be working alongside a major major conservancy institution which is the monterey bay aquarium and they have commissioned this project and so everything you see in the shop has been uh developing our means of creating a sculpture that we can't share yet exactly what it is. Maybe some of you already Large know. Creature. But um, yeah. it's um, basically to raise awareness for ocean conservancy, and the whole um, the whole project is going to be happening in here, and as well as in a steel fabrication shop nearby, where the frame of the beast will be created. But everything that you're seeing here, and everything that we're going to be talking about, is uh, to basically create the skin of a giant animal from. And um, yeah. that is a, it's a wild undertaking. This is, a, like I said, I've built many of these large scale animals from trash, uh, 26 or seven over the past five years. And this is unlike anything that I've ever done. Um, what we have embarked on here is, you know, using similar methods of structure and design, um, but an entirely different method of um, reclaiming material and uh, we'll tell you a little bit about those yeah. challenges and uh, processes. I mean we've decided, if you might have guessed, we've decided to use plastic. Um, we're focusing on plastic waste and what that means to us and 
um, we've gone through a lot of processes to choose what kind of plastic we we are using to make this skin. But I wanted to share kind of a, like a few facts about what what is our actual plastic consumption. So uh, how does what does that look like? Um, so far, since the 50s, plastic was created in the 1950s. So far, we've created 8.3 billion metric tons of plastic. Out of that, 6.3 billion metric tons is in landfill. Out of all of that, only 9% has been recycled ever. So um, only about, that's usually the rate of recycling. Recycling is really resource intensive. It is, it is labor intensive. It doesn't, plastic doesn't go away for 400 to 1,000 years. It is everywhere. It is dropping in the ocean. If we don't change our current habits, that number will double by 2050. And the, yeah, the rate is just ever increasing. And most plastic objects are only used for an average of 12 minutes. And they last on this planet for 400 to 12, wow. like 1,000 years. Wow. So it's definitely something to think about. Um, we've also created this, like, plastic is also very beautiful and it's very useful in a lot of different ways. So we have to, like, I don't know. Recycling seems like the answer, and what we hope to not promote is the fact that recycling is the answer. We have to deal with what we have made and cut it out. Like, cut it out and, like, stop that. But in the meantime, we have to clean up what we've done. So that's what we're kind of engaging in. Um, we decided to focus on number two and number four plastic. They're both polyethylenes. One's high density, one's low density. Um, <laughs> And they're very different in polymer structures, so they cannot be mixed. Everything that you see here has been sorted by hand. Um, we've gotten big bales and pretty much big, giant plastic dumps of material, and we've sorted each one by type, color, and either whether it's hard or soft plastic. Um, it's incredibly confusing and frustrating because a lot of plastic isn't labeled. Um, all of the bags that you will see around like the big plastic bags that are bagged, those are unlabeled bags that we cannot use actually for these purposes because we don't want to. We want to make sure our structure is solid and from what the research is now, we know that we cannot mix HDP and LDPE, so unmarked bags, there's a lot of ways. We can test them based on density and doing a lot of guesswork through float testing and tear testing and flame testing and whatnot, but for us to go through every single one of these bags right now, in our timeline, our sculpture is supposed to be done in September, <laughs> we don't have the capacity for that, so that we've been learning a lot of lessons and going through a lot of processing, but yeah, plastic is crazy. <laughs> a lot of the challenges that we're, as we're embracing, we're realizing that what we call recycling is more of a pat on our own back. It's a fallacy. There's no such thing. You're like very few things actually find a way to become something new. The entire process and the entire sorting of us having these different bins is really to make ourselves feel better about the process, you know? And for someone to actually take the time and effort to transform it themselves, you know, is one of the only ways that anything's going to happen locally. You know, China is not accepting our plastic anymore, period. And That's where all of our country's gold. waste went for this the is last decades. One of the first loads that um, one of our partners, Green Waste, has dumped in the US. The truck driver that dumped it here said that this is the first one in 10 years that he's ever dumped in the US. So this is the first one that's been diverted. And so uh, the fallacy extends to the positive side as well, because what we see as our waste is actually a really precious resource. And that's what we're here to show you and to, to prove with this project. And that what you can create with these single use products, you know, is. Uh, you know, the fact that it's around for 400 years can be a positive thing, you know, depending on how we're using it and what we're doing with it. And so, um, you know, it's all about sort of the, right now, there's a huge DIY culture. There's a, a revolution of plastic processing happening, and it was sparked by a group that inspired us in the beginning. They're called Precious Plastics, and they have their flags posted all over the world in literally every country in the world, I think, now. There's, like, mm -hmm. people doing this process. And uh, what it is is basically sorting it, grinding it, and using either an extrusion process or melting and compressing and molds 
making new durable products from pure plastic. But the challenges that are in, uh, involved in that are insane. Um, uh, we could talk for an hour straight about just the difficulties in identifying, cleaning, sorting, you know, every single bottle, even if you have a identified as number two plastic, has to be cleaned. The labels have to be cut off, uh, the impurities and blues and things. So the, the, the challenges are insane. We, we've been approaching them and with our insanely helpful crew and team of amazing people, we've started to surmount some of these obstacles, but it's it's wild, and uh, we're, we're just getting down to it. We'll be pressing the panels that will actually be the skin. Right now you can see a lot of the prototypes behind you on the tables, but um, we haven't even begun pressing the actual panels, and we will be getting that this week. So that's really exciting. Yeah. yeah. So should we all talk about the kind of flow? Yeah. So what we've created here is kind of a plastic recycling factory of many mini processing firm. So you can follow actually starting here, follow the blue labels, I mean blue arrows on the ground, and um, see what it's like to be a piece of trash through this cycle <laughs> and how you get transformed as we're going through this, where, you know, it's gonna be delivered here, get sorted through here, then here it goes either into cleaning or cutting straight away depending on how clean it is and what type of it. It goes through cleaning back there through our lovely gray water system set up by Cuesta and um, Dylan over there. <laughs> Flavel, Flavel water. Wow. Um, so we have a, we're recycling all our water that we're using here through the system. So we are not using gallons and gallons of water and not dumping it straight somewhere or having to ship it off site. We can recycle it and make it um, well, like clean enough to go back to the land. So, and reuse. Um, and we'll reuse. Constantly we can reuse constantly the reuse the same. Walk. Yeah. And then, so after that, it's going to then either go through a hand cutting process or a shredding process. We've, um, Joel's done some tricky things to the wood chippers <laughs> and made it cut plastic. Um, so we've been shredding it in there. And then it goes through, goes to our sorting area that will then get baked and pressed into a mold. So it's definitely a lengthy process, but it's, fun and definitely satisfying and worth it and I don't know we've been like feeling like every through every piece of trash like taking it through this process it's like praying to something that you call, like called waste and now you get to like stroke it and like love it and look at it and examine it and like take it through the whole journey and make it into something new hmm. so um yeah. It's, it's powerful for us, and it's been a really crazy experience to see a plastic bag go from that to this. So I encourage everyone to walk around and see kind of all the different bits. Um, and if you have any questions, um, find us or let us know. Do we want to open up for questions? For, do we well, I'm going to ask if you to pass around the panels and yeah. then maybe take questions. I'll grab. Yeah, 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 yeah sure. Sure. I have a question. Yeah. Bear in mind that plastic has been around for about 70 years, let's say, for the tech. How have they been able to equate how long it will remain on this planet for not being able to be broken down? How is that? I think it's, it's, it's a complex equation, but it has a lot to do with the type of plastic. You know, there's a whole litany, you know, one through right, seven, right. and number seven actually encompasses something like 40, 50 different grades that are, it's just uh, okay. other, so just you know, so basically, but like food. speaking of polyethylene or this type of plastic we're using, you know, it, it depends greatly on the, the density, the thickness, you know, the application that the plastic is being used for. Um, a plastic melt jug is going to be broke down by UV rays, you know, somewhat quicker than, say, your wheelie bin trash can. Right. But it's the same exact type of plastic, it's just ten times as so thick. So basically what you're advocating is that with the amount of plastic we already have on this planet from 70 years, we could probably learn how to use it for sustainable housing or making... We Any, don't really need to take the resources out of the earth anymore, let the trees remain and use it. So that's what you need to get behind you yeah. to do it on a large, massive scale. To yeah. me, the most beautiful thing about this as uh, advocacy or something that we can you know, share uh, is the method itself and what Precious Plastics inspired us yeah. to is they 
develop these means and it's a way that you can safely process these, meaning this type of plastic you can melt at low temperatures and it's not off-gassing, yeah. it's not toxic, you can breathe the air in the environment. And we're creating a really super durable, highly useful product for all kinds of applications. Art is just one Yeah, thing. and it's the, simple. The strength yeah. that you can achieve from this is literally unbreakable. And right? it's free. Right. It's free and it's like it's simple. Free. You can you need a heat source. Yeah. yeah. Show it off. Yeah. yeah. I mean, all you need is a heat trying. source and like a, a press, a mold of some sort. Yeah. Hard yeah. to break yeah. them. Yeah. But uh, it's not really. So there's possible. no other side. Yeah. Essentially, so creating right. more plastic, we have enough to yeah. go around. Yeah. Which side? Yeah. If they're used for really good applications. Each side. Yeah, we can. Oh, I can't do it now. <laughs> but um, you know, this idea that this can be done with almost no tools. Like we we made these in this shop with you know basic woodworking tools and an oven. But you could do this exact same thing if you lived in a third world country without power, without, exactly. you, you could start a fire and do this right? over a fire. Yeah, you know, yeah, you could do this with They just need anything. the education to know, you know, how to apply the heat, so it's not yeah. and escaping. Exactly, and so with a little bit of education, suddenly anyone who's interested in this could suddenly be transforming all their local trash. Because the minute we found this method, we now took, you know, a month's worth of the county's plastic, number two and number four, and we're now valuing it highly, you know, and uh, that same thing, you know, it's going to take that much for us to create this sculpture, but even on an individual level, you know, if someone wants to make one thing this big, they'll collect the plastic I mean, I've their entire neighborhood. I've plastic and precious being something like, before, so maybe that's where you need to, you know, where... The, the inroad of this, you know introducing that to people. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you too. Uh, can you just say a little bit about what the stereo process composable plastics? Yeah. I mean, so composable plastics are an okay alternative to plastic, um, but. They also, I mean, they're compostable in theory, but they do disrupt a normal compost cycle, so they take a lot longer to compost. So if you're, um, it would have to be a separate situation and be done in that way. Compostable plastic, is, yeah, can be used in a lot of ways like this type of plastic, but if you're putting it in a normal composting bale, it's gonna disturb the normal cycle, so. Another hey, um, So, I'm taking it that you chose polyethylene specifically because it's can be melted at a low temperature and it's not off gas in that whole situation. Actually, that's one of the questions I had. Do you have any idea what proportion of our plastic waste is this type of plastic? It's the most, well, like most prolific. The majority yeah. of all yeah. plastics yeah. in the world are PE. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Like how now. many types are there? Do you know? Uh, there's many, many types. Well, um, it's there's broken down in density, and so there's a window in okay. within each density, you know, and so there's there's ultra low density, there's low density, there's linear low density, linear low density, medium density, density. medium density, there's high density, okay. mm -hmm. and there's ultra high density polyethylene, which yeah, is density. literally yeah. ballistics armor. Oh wow! Ultra high density, this same stuff that's choking the ocean life in its film form is worn by our elite soldiers to protect them from bullets. So that which kills also heals. Can you speak some the idea of downcycling? Yeah, yeah. So a lot of plastics, um, another reason that recycling isn't the answer to all the things and we can't, we can't just keep producing it forever and say that we're just gonna recycle it. Not only that it's resource intensive, but a lot of plastics degrade every time you recycle them. So the polymer chains aren't as strong and they can't be used for the same application. So almost every time you recycle plastic, it will um, become a lesser degree of stability depending on how you do it. But polyethylene is pretty stable in its recycling process. Um, other ones are pretty tricky in their recycling process and degrade a lot more. So. Um, a couple times you've said, you know, the, the process we've developed, so if we could just tease that part out. The we is you two, the we is you two plus Monterey Bay plus the water people. Who is the we I mean, in terms of develop how much, uh, I, I, I guess because there is, you said that most of the recycling has been happening in China. So how much of a frontier is there 
here in America or in the world in terms of figuring out how to recycle stuff into durable stuff? Like how much have you come up with and how much is like your backers and, and well, we else? We are fully just learning from our predecessors, which is, like I said, Precious Plastics is the group that is sharing all this information worldwide. They're making tutorials, they're making videos, they're making open source technologies. You can print the machines, laser cut the steel parts, make your own grinding, processing machines, extruders, everything. So a lot of the, the advice, the methods, the process comes from this online community, you know, yeah. and so. Well, there's that and also recycling a thing, so there's a, a lot of research around it and there's a lot of polymer scientists and there's a lot of like. We're recycling a DIY method. Yeah. This is so like, this, whole, is, this is essentially home recycling. And so when we talk of the word recycling, part of the fallacy is that it's, it encompasses anything. This is actually more like reuse than recycling, mm -hmm. you know, if you want it to be more specific. Recycling is an industrial process <laughs> that requires machines that is not in our budget, you know. <laughs> and so, but this, you know, to answer your question that what can we do, you know, or that, like, uh, the idea that we can ship everything off to another country yeah. is basically negating all the benefit of reusing that material in the first place. So anything we can do locally with it, I think, is a major step forward. Um, I was curious, when, when we think about art and its messages, a lot of art that has a powerful message, which clearly whatever comes to this will be, just by the method of creating it, can't wait to see the final product, but people will walk by and go, that's pretty, or that's visually pleasing, and maybe not catch the larger theme, yeah. um, and because, you know, 5% of people might stop and say, oh my god, that's plastic, oh, I get what they're saying here, and I was just curious if, knowing what these prototypes look like, knowing what Monterey Bay wants to do in regards to where their placement and what kind of signage they're going to have, yeah. do you think the majority of people walking by will be aware of what's going on, or will they just see a pretty animal? I, I think that's entirely up to the human, and it, just like, you know, uh, in this room or in any room, uh, there's a cross-section of humans that are either going to be preoccupied or they're going to really respond or resonate with an idea or a thing, and to me, Although it may not be as obvious, there's been many, many large creatures built, sculptural creatures made with reclaimed plastic, but we have yet to find one that's been done using this method. And to me, part of the strength of it is that no one would recognize it as plastic. So the people that do take the time to either uh, take that information in or seek that information out from all the, the signage and things, to be able to see something that you're surprised to learn that that was your waste, to me, is a much more powerful message yeah. than saying, look, uh, all our junk, right. you know, and like, we've how... We've seen that. We see that, and it's overwhelming. It's like, to see all of the trash is overwhelming. This is what we created here. It's overwhelming to see that, but we want people to not only be overwhelmed, but find a solution. How do you help? Because a lot of these global problems, nobody knows what to do. You know, they so like, okay, how do I even start dealing with my plastic waste? I have no time for that. I have no jobs. I have just kids. I have whatever. It's like, there's a solution. Here's this. It's a solution-based approach, and there's, I don't know, that offered. That's why we chose this because it offered more hope than just the problem. So. Uh, in like 2005, I mean, I was first introduced to the concept of like the vegetable oil conversions on diesel cars, and you could get vegetable oil from restaurants for free everywhere, and now you can. So it's kind of interesting to show like a DIY solution to changing industry. And like I'm from Reno, and now a couple of the casinos use vegetable oil for the heat because this was demonstrated as like you know, and that's probably more for biodiesel and biofuels and a greater narrative. But I wonder how much this kind of a process being demonstrated in makerspaces and DIY applications can lead to becoming more of a disruptive um, industry model. You know, and that's like a, a hope that I would like to see what you think of. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah, I mean, we hope, I mean, we're dreaming far beyond and more to all the different applications and hope there, like, we can create a demand for this. So then not only do we stop, but we create a demand. And, you know, there's a lot of opportunities in that, whether it's job creation, whether that's, what, you know, there's, it can go forever, and yeah, we have a lot of it, so. And so then, can you speak to what you were telling me about uh, making like a, like putting it on a lathe and then reclaiming the chips and like. Some yeah, sort of one of the most beautiful processes is, is that um, no matter how you work the material, once you, you could create blocks, you could create sheets, you can create tiles, you can 
work them on lathes, on mills, on anything uh, technologically advanced machinery to create really, uh, you know, highly accurate parts or things or objects. Um, but at the same time, I prefer, and we're much more attuned to like the DIY and the hand methods of creating, but the applications for this go way beyond what we're doing. And uh, that every single scrap that is the dust created is can go right back into the next batch. That there's never, you know, this process of creating microplastics, we do our best to contain yeah. all of it and so that every single scrap of dust that we're creating. Anything that we don't know about mm. goes in here. So. Eco bricks. Eco bricks. <laughs> you can do this at home. You can put all your plastic little scrappies into an eco brick, and that will even make sure they don't fly away. Because that's part of the reason a lot of stuff gets blown away and it flies all over the place. Yeah. In your wildest fantasy of what this could inspire, because as soon as the human population doesn't go down, Assuming that people continue to want to consume goods, I mean, even if people got very mindful and we all stopped using water bottles and all this, yeah. I, I think it'd be aggressive to get to half our current consumption. You're basically saying that's not nearly enough. So, like, you do you have a sense of like, what a better world would look like where we avoid the problem? I do, yeah. I mean, I've had, I've had a lot of thoughts around this, and to me, what we're talking about is about dealing locally with our waste we're creating. And as a community, even in this house, what we've witnessed is that, you know, the, the 10 or 15 people that commonly have a this property are producing so much packaging, you know, it's massive. So to, to, to make any, to take any bite out of this problem, there needs to be locally oriented spaces. And to me, in the far flung vision of this, there is community spaces that are, you know, juvenile um, delinquents, kids that need jobs or that get in trouble with the law are employed to source and collect materials, whether it be pallets or trash or things that are all brought to a central recycling place in the community where other people and mentors and teachers help transform all these objects into community resources, a stash of reclaimed wood, of reclaimed metal, of reclaimed plastic, and the processing equipment materials to do it. So it becomes educational, it becomes like a big brother, big sister program, it becomes like a community resource that's actually breathing in all of our junk and breathing out skills and usable materials. It's like, to me, a real simple thing that can happen that uh, it just takes community involvement. It takes people actually like saying, oh, we could do that. Yeah, well, and to speak to that, I mean, I think that there's, that's like what a world looks like without plastic, we don't have to look that far back, which is what we forget about sometimes, that this was only developed in the 50s and that seems a long time ago, but it's not. And there's a lot of like solutions that are simple that we can incorporate if there's a market for it and if that people demand the use for it. If you, there's a lot of ways that you could reduce your waste today and start bulk shopping, doing other, all kinds of solutions and I mean, what a world would look like without plastic is an interesting thought. But we'll never know. I don't know if we'll ever know. Hopefully we get to a point where we do it, but I think it's important for us to also know that, I don't know, for me, it's a system of also slowing down. We use without asking. We take, we take without asking. We use without caring where it goes. Waste is just a concept of a human concept. Trash doesn't exist in nature. Everything's reused, recycled. Mm -hmm. It's repurposed. It's like repurposed. It's fuel for something else. It's an industry. So it's like if you look at nature and if we model my future world around the systems, the natural systems that exist, that would be my model: is how we could see everything as valuable, as precious, and everything we create. Is this is the shadow <laughs> material of our consumer world, you know, and mm -hmm. to engage to honor the shadow, you know, the, the darkness we're creating, that is like massive, like that to me is some of the most powerful work you can do because it's, it's everywhere. <laughs> I know we're running short on time, but yeah. Just real quick, it's sort of a tangent, but when you're talking about community re reclaimed resource depots, um, did you happen to look 